Welcome to the Inspired Evolution, and it is such a treat to be here today. Actually, it's more than a treat. It's an absolute blessing to be here today because we have the vibes from Irfan Daliri. Elfan, how are you, bro? <laughs> I'm good, brother. Thanks so much. He's an educator. He's an author. He's an event director. And we can't, well, I can't wait to talk about this event, man. He's an internationally toured performance poet, and he's got a background in community development and a postgraduate degree in communication for social change. So the one thing we will consistently find, I think, is this community development aspect. He's an agent of social mm-hmm. change. He's on a mission to instigate systemic change and create social justice while empowering others to become agents of change and champions of justice in their own community, right? He's worked as a consultant and advisor to a great number of organizations, including reputable organizations such as Amnesty International, Beyond Blue, Mother Rush Aboriginal Corporation, Risden Prison, and the Townsville Intercultural Center. He's got over 15 years of experience in community development, youth work, events management, volunteering, and social change consultancy. And he draws from a deep well of experience in des- to, from designing projects to mentoring youth and hosting seminars and training sessions worldwide. Whether it's presenting a resilience training seminar, a performance philosophy set, social change masterclass, or managing community development projects, the through line of this work is social change and challenging the st- status quo. As the director of New Kind, <laughs> yes, New Kind, <laughs> <laughs> much of his work focuses on empowering, inspiring, and activating agents of social change with a keen interest in projects related to youth education, right, the environment, and elimination of economic extremes, mental health, and gender equality. And I can't tell you how much of a treat it is to have you today. <laughs> My pleasure. Thanks, brother, for having me. <laughs> Let's go straight into a man. So, like, first thing I want to dive sure. into is New Kind Festival. It's coming up in Feb, yeah? Mm-hmm. Yeah, it is. It's coming up 19th to 24th of Feb. This will be the third one we're holding. Uh-huh. It's an annual event in Tasmania. Yeah, I'm really, yeah. really excited. Going from strength to strength. Tell us a little bit about Tasmania, like, because the vibe there is like, it's a bit more like, it's got this, you know, there's that museum and there's all these little totally. things going on. It's definitely got this, like, um, I want to say it's not an art house vibe, but it's very nature oriented, but like yeah. activist yeah. vibe, but like not on a very root totally. system level, like on actually on, yeah. like a, on a global sort of landscape sort of level. Totally. Yeah, yeah. yeah. It's, uh, I mean, the, the trick is here, I don't know how much to tell you because I don't want to advertise it too much. We're quite happy with the population we've got. <laughs> 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 we don't. You don't want to give it the kick to death on this podcast. Yeah. For all the yeah. thousands, what we thousands, don't need thousands is more like property developers. We don't need any more investment property developers coming through here. Uh, Tazzy's got an incredible vibe. It's very close to nature, obviously. Um, mm. Uh, a large part of the state, a great deal of it is um, heritage listed and protected. Some of it obviously isn't, and that's some, you know it's a contentious issue here. But very much so, everyone here is aware of the environment. If not, they're uh, you know if they're not involved in agriculture and, and farming, which and it produces a great deal of produce. Um, you know, it's the ecotourism industry um, and or controversially the the logging industry. So like the the economy here does uh, is closely connected to nature and the environment and taking care of it. So yeah. the conversations around sustainability um, are more prevalent here than they would say would be in, in Sydney or Melbourne or Brisbane. Um, so, yeah, as a, as a state, you're much closer to nature. Um, you're 10 or 15 minutes away from, from it, even in the major cities like Hobart. And there is a, a higher percentage of artists um, per, per thousand, you know. Uh, so, yeah, it's got a pretty good vibe going for it here mm-hmm. uh, but yeah don't tell too many people because uh, <laughs> property, <laughs> property prices are already going up rates are getting out of hand um so <laughs> yeah just keep it quiet on that <laughs> awesome so if this episode is going to be a bit like chops away a bit here a bit there i'm not going to really follow a linear fashion just because there's so totally. much i've into with you but I, um, I think mm. just as we're talking about Tasmania, I think we run the risk of sort of suggesting that, you know, being in Tasmania and being in that nature-oriented environment um, may have been what influenced you to create a festival like New Kind. But I know that your story is also quite unique. Mm. Um, you were born in yeah. India. You were born actually without, without, without a country, really. Can you tell us a little bit more yeah. about your background, bro, and, like, all that, like, yeah, just yeah. that story a little bit, share yourself with us a little totally. bit. Totally. Yeah, I think um, I definitely have a connection with Tassie because this was our first port of call when we arrived to the country. But before we came here, my parents were refugees in India, mm. uh, originally from, from Iran. So they, they'd escaped Iran separately. They happened to meet in India 
and were married there. And soon after I was born, they applied um, to, to the UN to get refugee um, recognition. Um, and then, yeah, they got visas uh, to come to Australia and soon after got citizenship. So we came to Australia as refugees. I was born in India um, as a child of refugee parents without a state because I'd escaped illegally from Iran. Um, and we moved to Devonport first and foremost. We came here straight up, um, and my sisters were both born in Australia. So we landed here, spent a couple of years here, um, and then slowly made our way up the coast from here, went to Melbourne, and from Melbourne went all the way up to Townsville, actually, and I grew up in Townsville. And from a very young age, um, community development and youth engagement and Indigenous community work was a part of my life. My father um, had been doing that work in India before he got to Australia, he ended up doing his PhD in education, um, in Indigenous literacy specifically. Um, so we spent a lot of time, um, you know, around dad's work. And as a kid growing up, that just became normal for us, you know, a life of service. Uh, my mother also, um, she's been working in the sector for many years, uh, helping refugee families settle into Australia. Um, so, yeah, living a life of service, being an active agent of change um, and trying to make the world a, a better place. Um, wasn't something that I stumbled across, you know, halfway through my life. It was always very much so a part of, uh, of our life at home. Um, so, yeah, it feels like of all the things that happened, um, New Kind was just part of that gradual kind of progression and it just made sense to come back to Tassie to do it um, because of what it was and, you know, how well Tasmania suited it. Um, so I thought, yeah, I'll, I'll come back to our original landing place in Australia and, and start from here. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing that, brother. Um, yes, yeah, no, <laughs> you made that sound <laughs> graceful, but I can only imagine, you know, what like, you know, like growing up, um, your family having a child, you know, not having a state to the, the, their son's name and then, you know. Just- oh, totally. Yeah, there's a lot of challenges in there, you know, heaps of ups and downs. And, you know, my father was imprisoned at the age of 17. Um, for his beliefs and tortured in, in prison in Iran and, you know, coming to Australia with 50 bucks, you know, that's all he had and, you know, a suitcase full of clothes with, you know, with my mum and me. So, yeah, definitely heaps of challenges, but I feel like um, it's best to focus on, you know, the, the, the beauty of it, you know, the things that have come out of it um, and you just take, take challenges as, you know, things that make you grow. I mean, that's, that's really how I grow. Again, following the chop suey nature of this episode, then let's let's talk in, into that because the first thing that really resonated, like that really like hit home when I first met you, was um, you know this idea of you know looking at things a certain way, and we're talking mm. about challenges now. So I'm going to kind of use that as the segue because setting up a festival, yeah. you've got hundreds of volunteers, you've got you know mm. dozens and dozens and dozens of speakers traveling in from all over the world to speak, and not even to like yeah. to be like. I know Melbourne is attractive, Sydney is attractive, but getting them right. to Tasmania, right? Logistically, yeah. there's the challenges. And we're talking about <laughs> you, yeah. that new kind festival here, right? So it's not just every other run-of-the-mill festival. Like you supply, you cook right. everyone. There is no mm-hmm. waste, right? So like mm-hmm. these logistics are all yeah. like, it's it's just, powered. <laughs> 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 yeah. Like yeah. it's almost like you're a masochist. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> I just <laughs> might be. How <laughs> can I make this for myself? You know, but it's, it's right. It's, totally, you know, the vision is so strong and so potent to really set like a beacon and a shining example of what it can be like for a new kind of way of living um, and, mm-hmm. and learning. And uh, obviously, the education and the service, you know, from your background are really vibrant. Really, they resonate in that. But the one thing that really honed into me was like, you know, we were talking about, you know, just the challenges of running something like this. And I remember yeah. saying, you know, like everything always falls into place. You know, mm-hmm. it was just like everything, like it may be the day before the event and just something small, like, you know, all my refrigerators, like just die. <laughs> like I've got like all these people to cook for and now I need to find a place, you know, and this is the day before the event. There should be a million other things I should be doing but you always mm. find a way to make things happen. And I think I'm just yeah. drawing in on the fact of like just the mindset that you had. I remember connecting in with you and just really going, mm-hmm. wow, this is actually someone that just make, that actually does make the best of every situation and doesn't stress too much okay. about what's upcoming but sort of stays present mm-hmm. with what's on hand. Can you talk to us a little bit about that and how that you've cultivated that? Absolutely. Yeah, totally. Um, I've read a, a, a quote this morning that actually um, resonates with me really strongly and has informed a lot of my life. And it said, prayer is useless. Mm. And then long pause. It says, meditation is useless. Along the long pause. And it says, prayer and meditation are useless without action. 
And that's what the intention of that quote was. It's like, it's not that they're useless, but unless you actually act on that intention, on that prayer, um, and act as if it's already been answered, then both of them together, prayer and meditation without action, don't actually equate to very much if that's all you're relying on. Um, so I'm very much action focused. I'm like, I do pray daily and I do meditate daily, but it's about that action. That is the third part of that you know, amazing trilogy, prayer and meditation, getting that divine, divine message or you know, inspiration and then acting on it. It's the third pillar of it. So um, for me, getting new kind off the ground was the action part of the prayer. You know, like you, you want to make the world a better place. You have that intention. You seek guidance. You meditate on it. Um, and then you have to act. Um, and you have to act as if your prayers have been answered. You know, you have to act as if there is no doubt in your mind, um, unless, uh, of course, you want to fail. So you have to believe that it's already done. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, if you're acting and you're not quite sure, like, oh, is it, you know, should I be doing this, should I not, then you haven't got faith in your prayer and meditation. Um, so that's how I try to run my life is that, um, you know, you've got to be action oriented. You've got to act, actually do the things that you intend on doing um, and then it's not that it always falls into place, but it always falls into some sort of a place, you know, like it's, it might not be exactly as you had imagined. It might not have been um, exactly as you had planned it to be, but the thing is it, it actually, it happened. And that's, what's important, not, not how it landed um, and whether, you know, the buses arrived on time or whether this speaker made it to their connecting flight and, and it, whether the stage was running late or not. What's important is that it actually went ahead. Um, and that's kind of how I try and live my life is by, by doing it, um, by taking those massive leaps um, and sticking the landing somehow, you know. Um, so, yeah, I, I feel like uh, a lot of us um, could take a lot from that these days um, with, you know, expecting, especially when it's to do with social change and social justice and wanting the world to change. We have good intentions. We can see there's problems in the world. Um, we can acknowledge that, you know, the, the economic construct we're living in isn't working. We know that we're destroying the environment and everyone wants to do better. Um, but few people, uh, and th I mean, when I say few, I mean not everyone, but there is a great number of people who actually still go out there and, and do the thing that needs to get done. And that's what we need to see more of in this world. If we are going to, you know, correct this trajectory is that more of us need to just do the thing, you know, um, and, and if you see something that needs to get done, make it your responsibility and address that issue, whether it's the education system, whether it's our excessive consumerism, um, you know, whether it's gender equality in, 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 in the film and media industry, like whatever it is, make it your task um, and go out there and complete it. And that's how we're going to create a more just and equitable society is if we just um, take charge and take responsibility for this ecology that we're living in you know, the social ecology the environmental ecology the the economic ecology it's, it's our home we've got to we've got to do something about it and that's that's what motivated me to get new kind off the ground i really value what you're saying because we started about you know just your mindset and your your perspective on taking action but then at the same time what you're elaborating on is like you know everybody needs to take action and there's mm. such a myriad of spaces that need to be taken action on and it, it generally feels overwhelming, you know, like it's when you, when you start thinking about, you know, okay, so, you know, I've got to cut down my use of plastic. I've got to make sure I have shorter showers. I've got to make sure I don't, you know, I, if I can consume less meat, mm -hmm. that'd be really good because obviously there's, you know, yeah. there's all these things to tackle. And one person yeah. sort of looks at it and goes, mate, that's so much to chew. And this is kind of where I was coming yeah. at in the previous question as well. Like you've managed to take a, like a massive chunk out of like some really, really, really big pies. For those tuning in, I'm just going to yeah. take a moment, right? So this gives you an idea of some of the stuff that's on at New Kind Festival, right? So plastic, plastic free living is a workshop, solar power practice and principles, event sustainability processes, right? So this is all like environmental sort of stuff. Then you've got introduction to emotional support. You've got economic injustice. And then you've got stuff on mental health. Are we really okay? You've got plant-based nutrition. So again, this is internal wellness now. Then you've got cultural awareness in terms of in, you know, like in understanding indigenous um, cultures. You've got sustainable yeah. consumerism. So now this is like economic again. Um, obviously, mm -hmm. there's little bits of yoga, fitness, movement and stuff in there. You've got mindfulness stuff like teaching peace. And then you've got environmental protection campaigns. There's yep. like I, the list goes on, you know, like this is obviously I'm just reading yeah. stuff in one day. Totally. So yeah. That, like I find absolutely like fascinating. And the thing that I like, and I just, I cannot hug you enough for <laughs> is basically <laughs> that, you know, there's like, you're looking at the economics, you're looking at the environment, yeah. you're also looking at the well-being. And it's like, 
this massive like trifecta, if not more, avenues of coming together for wellness. But it's human wellness, <laughs> mental wellness, physical wellness, but also the wellness of our environment. And to be honest, it's yeah. something that really excites me because for me, I'm a meditator that was passionate about architecture that became a structural engineer. Mm. For me, it's all about yeah. the ontology of like the world outside is reflected in the world inside. And this is one of my Absolutely. deepest fascinations, right? But you've managed yeah. to address like so much in a four to five day festival to just like revamp like the whole way of being, you know, and what you're saying <laughs> about action and prayer is really inspiring. Mm. Yeah. Thanks, man. I, um, yeah, I definitely feel like uh, it, it can it can seem like it's overwhelming at times, and that's why it was so important for me to, to get pull this program together. Because if you just look at the like, most people have a have a view of the of the problems. You know, that's what the media feeds us. It's what social media gives us. You know, the newspapers. Um, and if that's your perspective, then yeah, definitely overwhelming. But then when you can come together. Um, to, to a curated event where it's not just talk, the problems, or we're actually speaking about solutions. People that have come, you know, back from the field that have got ten or twenty or thirty years of experience, um, or have, you know, spent decades writing fifteen books on you know peacekeeping and conflict management, then it becomes a little less overwhelming. And when you can see the dots, the dots beginning to join with each other. Mm -hmm. Then it's like, ah, now I can see the picture. Now I can see how mental health is connected to domestic violence, is connected to environmental degradation and what deep ecology has to do with ecofeminism which is, and what's that got to do with economic justice. And when you can start to, to draw those lines, then it's like, ah, okay, I can, I can, map, out, I can map out a plan here. I, I can, you know, make a little impact in, in my own way. Uh, and that's why it's so important to me, despite the challenges, despite the hardships of getting this off the ground without any funding, without any grants, um, it's because I know people want to make a difference. You know, it's, we are inherently good in nature. You know, uh, when we are unafraid and unhurt, um, we, we are inherently good, kind beings and we want the best for our, our families and our communities and the world. Um, so it's just a matter of empowering people who already want to make a difference to be able to make that difference. Um, and again, also on the overwhelming element of things, I mean, I, you, don't, you don't have kids, do you, yet? Not yet. <laughs> no, no neither, neither do I, neither do I. But my sister recently had, had a baby, Layla, and she's, you know, four months old now. Um, and literally every minute of their day is, you know, feeding, sleeping, um, you know, putting her to sleep, uh, changing nappies, bathing her, changing clothes, feeding, like literally every second of the day. And if it's not that, you know, it's chiro appointments or, you know, nutritionist appointments or whatever, like literally every minute you're thinking about that child and it's health, it's health, it's safety, it's well-being. Mm. you know, the minutest thing that happens, you've got to address that. Mm. That's kind of how much we've got to love our planet and the people that we inhabit it with. And then it becomes less overwhelming. You know, imagine if parents were like, oh, I've got to do this and I've got to do that. And I can't think about all of these things at the same time. But you know what? Because of love, we do. We consider the health and well-being of that child. We consider the temperature it's at. We consider its education, its food, everything. Um, and when we actually love our environment and our fellow beings that inhabit this planet with us, then nothing's overwhelming. It's like, oh, I've just got to do this because that's the best thing for this family of mine. You know, mm -hmm. and I think... Once we start seeing um, the entire planet as a single family, as a single organism, as a single community, um, then the health and well-being um, of it become paramount to us. Um, and injustice is something we just can't stand by and witness. Yeah. There's something that's been, um, it's a very subtle thing that dropped in for me recently, but um, and I'm not sure if I can do it justice in this conversation, but it's what's coming up for me now, which is, you know, there's this idea that we come into the world. You know, mm. It's like a collective, yeah. like we come into the world. Like I was born into this world. Mm. I was born into the world. And we leave. <laughs> and we leave somewhere, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> you know, but the reality of the situation is actually right. we're just plants and seeds and stuff as well. We came, it's from, like we're emerging, right? We're emerging yeah. out yeah. of this oh, world. Yeah. And to think that we're disconnected is this epic That's illusion. It. Like it's very subtle. But it makes such totally. a massive difference. Um, totally, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's um. I mean, and that's one of the one of the the, the pitfalls or the traps of that you know uh, spirituality without balance can lead us to is that this disconnection that oh, I've got to become enlightened to get ready to leave this space or that you know I'm not from this planet I'm alien to this world or 
you know, this isn't my home, that sort of rubbish. The fact is, you know, as you, as you just said, we are of this world. It just as every tree and leaf and animal on this planet is of this world and comes of this world and will never leave this world. Mm. Um, if anything, we might become uh, evolved, enlightened, and be able to see different dimensions of this same existence. Um, but just like a, a, a child coming out of the womb of a, of a mother, you don't ever leave the world. You just happen to, to be reborn, but you're still in the same space, physically, spiritually. Um, and we have to treat this place like that, like a home. We are of this place. It didn't come from some other place and we're not leaving to go to some other place. How we treat this womb um, you know, is, is con- deeply connected to our own spiritual development and progress. Um, mm-hmm. So, yeah, absolutely. I, I really love that you brought up that point. Yeah, I love um, what you're touching on right now as well is that, you know, this idea of, you know, because the ancient wisdom suggests that people have been calling Mother Earth, Mother Earth for a while. And I know I sound like a complete hero right. to say that, right? But it's like that whole idea right. of embryonic womb of nature. But we come from this world. Mm-hmm. And what you're sharing, like with the whole unity factor, I love 2018. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, for some reason, I just am so juiced to be alive in this time and I'm so grateful. Yeah. We've got things like the science backs it up. Like this is a 90, 90, 98 to 99% carbon-based reality. You know, so mm-hmm. as much as you're different to what I am, you're mm-hmm. made of such similar molecules right. to what I am. Do you know what I mean? Like you're I like, <laughs> you know, and so kind of <laughs> like we've got this really amazing opportunity at the moment to like have science and have this thought like back up yeah. a lot of the things that we've been feeling emotionally sentimentally and like the wisdom has been speaking to for a long time and now mm-hmm. science can sort of come in and be like you know what there is actually a way to sort of codify justify what's actually going on in a real like yeah. understandable repeatable pragmatic fashion um so how do you feel like about the future because i know you're saying like new kind is really solution oriented um, mm-hmm. and I think that is like, like a message that I just really, I'm like really enthusiastic about is that, you know, oftentimes yeah. people get together and it's, it's very easy to sort of, and I think it's also important to raise awareness for things that are not working. I think there's definitely a space for that. Um, but I think after a while Ooh. that kind of, you know, ends up in a place where it can be quite toxic, um, in, mm-hmm. uh, there's no better word for yeah. it in my humble opinion. Totally. You know, it's like you kind of, you end up chopping off your own legs. You kind of end up stagnant when you just keep complaining, 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 complaining. And I'm not saying that you shouldn't complain. I'm just saying that, you know, I think the real key, and I think a really dear friend of ours, um, Jason, he, he, he mm. talks to me about this a lot. He's like, yes, absolutely. You've got something to complain about, complain. But before you even begin to complain, meditate and figure out what the solution is that you can right. do in right what can you propose yeah yeah to trump that if you don't have a better if you don't have a better solution then maybe bide your time and wait to think about it yeah you know actually take yeah exactly take the time to think about it and that's what um and that's that's another thing that i'm like really like really passionate about new kind festival for which is Mm. so many thinkers that have so many solutions coming together to bond and uh has that always been your awareness to sort of make sure that you know you're more solution oriented or have you obviously gone down your journey and your path and learned that you know there's been oh totally yeah like i've totally had my journey i mean i was i was the angriest you know anti-consumerist kind of activist out there that there was you know i've totally had that period as well Mm -hmm. and i see it as um as a an actual a, a part of the process for me um and a part of the process um, as a whole as well. And what I mean by that is that um, oftentimes when we are going from that, and this is where I was, not to say everyone, some of the people today don't have to start there, but I started in a, in a very, um, you know, like I was trying to fit into society and I, was, I had a business, I was studying engineering and I wanted to, you know, buy a home and you know, raise a family. And, and, you know, and I, as much as I wanted to serve the community, I wasn't too concerned with the, the state of the entire world. I was just focused on my close community. And when you become aware of injustices and when you become aware of things that aren't working, whether it's animal rights or gender equality, or when you become even more aware of the economic injustice of this world and the system we're living in, an initial response will be anger, you know, an initial response will be hurt, you know, Um, and that causes frustration and it causes yelling and screaming and protesting and rallying and pointing at something that's not working. Um, And that's part of the process because we first have to become aware that something's unjust we first have to become aware that something is not working um and the activist circuit and the activist scene 
um, in all of the areas of, of social justice. They're all very important because those activists are serving the greater community uh, in, in pointing towards an issue that needs to be addressed. Mm-hmm. But then the next, the next cog in that system, um, the, the next gear is becoming solutions focused. So an activist raises awareness about an issue that needs to be addressed, but they're not necessarily addressing the issue. Now, whether they're a vegan, um, you know, animal rights activist or a gender equality activist, taking to the streets and screaming, yelling about one thing says that there's something wrong and that we need to look at this. And, and we need that because a lot of people aren't able to even look at it to even think that there might be something wrong in you know, sexism, misogyny, you know, in climate change, whatever. Um, but then what happens, as Jason was saying, our friend, and he had that journey as well. I mean, I remember speaking with him deep, uh, deeply about how um, he went from the animal rights activist, environmental activist, to actually what is the solution I'm proposing? You know, how can I actually um, alleviate this issue? Now, whether it's writing children's books on how to deal with the environment or with animals or whether it's about doing a PhD in circular economies, you know, it doesn't matter. There is solutions to all of these issues um, and that's the beauty of it. It's not that we're stuck in a world that isn't changing and evolving. The world is changing and evolving. It is, in fact, what life is. Life is constantly evolving and changing and there are solutions. Um, so, yeah, I didn't start off like that. I was working in the community development and social services kind of sector, which was as a teenager and in my 20s, that was seeing to the needs of the wounded. You know, it was um, trying to fix some of the problems without getting to the root cause. Um, And it was during the process of doing my master's degree uh, um, in communication for social change, which I began to see how um, we need to start addressing the root causes. Um, and beyond just the fact that oh, we have economic injustice and we've got the effects of colonialism and we've got gender imbalances in society, what, what's causing all of this? You know? And I became very much obsessed with finding the root causes of some of these issues. Um, and I came to certain you know, understandings and hypotheses, but then I realized that there's people who have spent years, if not decades, looking at these. So, and that's how the idea of new kind began to form. It's like, oh, I've got an idea that maybe domestic violence has a close connection to mental health and economic injustice. Let's have a look at that. It has someone done studies on that, for example, you know, um, is male suicide connected to, um, you know, lower socioeconomic areas, for example. Um, and we, we find that yes, there actually is a connection to it as well. Um, um, all these types of things. I thought, well, why don't I bring the people who have thought deeply about these issues together um, so we can get to the root cause. And that's why we include things like uh, mental health, you know, in a, in a social justice conference. Um, it's why we look into issues of like, you know, c- circular economies and deep ecology and understanding why are we destroying the planet? Um, and deep ecology has, you know, has an answer for that as well, as does indigenous knowledge systems. You know, it's because of the disconnection from nature. You know, that trauma that we feel by being disconnected to nature causes us to cause further harm. So, yeah, it was definitely a process for me of going, from that um, activist, um, angry, hurt phase of what's going wrong to becoming very much solutions focused and looking at the root causes of issues and addressing them right then and there. Amazing. Thank you so much for sharing, brother. I want to find out, like, how has your journey been with New Kind over the last three years? Not so much the logistics of it, but more so the energy when you're looking at the world through the New Kind lens. Um, Mm. And what I'm trying to say is that, you know, like just being aware of like, you know, like now I have the amazing ability to travel the world, touch wood as an inspirational speaker. Mm. Um, but like a big part of my work is basically corporate mindfulness and meditation. And yeah. just in thinking that, you know, in 2018, I have the ability to have that as a career, you know, is like, it was mm. just right. I'm aware that that wasn't a potential, not even five years ago, you know, it was very, that mm. was not a thing. And so what I would love to sort of just, pick in this conversation a little bit in this juncture is to sort of see like how have you seen the world kind of evolving like is it for the better or is it just i'm becoming more aware Mm. of these things that they exist because now there's a lot more it seems like there's a lot more social businesses a lot more social entrepreneurialism people are being rewarded for their like uh, like um i guess environmental innovations and their social innovations for the better you know um, the whole idea totally. of the B Corp is, you know, when there's more and more of these popping mm. up and all these sort of things, you know, all these initiatives and they're geared towards like making society and people better. 
Is that kind yeah. of a reflection on where we're going in your opinion or is it still there's more work to do? Tell us more about like what you've seen over the last three years. with New Totally, Zealand. yeah, yeah. It's definitely both. It's definitely the tip of the iceberg as, uh, as well as uh, it is the direction we're heading in. So um, I'm working on and with New Kind and the presenters uh, and the programming that we put together definitely has given me a great deal more hope than I had, say, three years ago. Um, seeing that the, the depth of work that people are doing, um, you know, four years ago, I wasn't really aware of the concept of deep ecology. Um, mm. And even though my writings um, were, you know, uh, would, would actually be classified as ecofeminism, I didn't know ecofeminism existed five or six mm. years ago. You know, and now I'm like, oh, it's actually a school of thought. Cool. Awesome. Um, so in, over the last five years, I've definitely gained an immense amount of hopefulness and I can see um, the beauty in the destruction as well. Um, there's definitely a lot of injustice still going on and I will speak about this differently depending on who I'm speaking to. If I'm trying to motivate someone to get off their ass and actually do something and change their life, then I will tell them, you know, suicide rates are going through the roof, domestic violence going insane, climate change is an issue. Blah, blah, blah. And I'll tell them, look, you have to get up and do something. And that's that activist in me. You know, it wants people to get up and do something. But if I'm speaking with people who are already at New Kind, or if I'm speaking with someone like yourself and your audience, then I would definitely be focusing on, well, actually, we've done an immense amount of good work in the last 10 years, 20 years. Um, and the direction we're heading um, is inevitable peace and, and, and just society that is sustainable. Um, that is definitely the trajectory we, we are on. It's just that in the process of getting there, the old systems that weren't working, the, the old constructs that were failing us, they need to crumble. And that's traumatic. You know, when everything we put all of our hopes and dreams into, whether it's the economic construct or whether it was this idea of white supremacy or male supremacy or whatever it is, all of these things that society was built upon, this house of cards, that has to crumble. Mm. Um, and when, when, when our hopes and dreams as a society have been pinned to these false ideals, that's going to hurt as it's coming down. So there's going to be injustice, there's going to be you know, famine and there's going to be uh, climate change, loss of uh, species like, you know, like we've never seen before. But in the failing, there is also new systems arising that are more sustainable and that are more equitable, ideas that are serving the whole rather than the, 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 the nation or the individual. Um, so it's this twin processes of destruction and creation that are happening at once. And it's just a matter of being able to hold both and be like, look at that see how it's not working and look at that and, and see how that's, that is working and, and hold both sides of that perspective um, and focusing our energies on the side that's developing and creating new solutions, um, but always being aware of where we've come from and why we need to leave that old paradigm, all of them, behind. Yeah, I think what you're speaking to is, um, is deeper than just the surface level of what you're articulating because I think... Um, one thing I'm quite acutely aware of is the fact that we produce enough food on the planet for no one to go hungry, mm. yet a third of totally. the planet goes hungry because in the West right. we, we throw out a third of our food. Now, right. how long did that? I kind of see Donald Trump and I go, wow, that's kind of like a blessing, you know, because now the whole world can see that politics is just really just business, you know? It's, it's like, yeah. you know, yeah. It's like, yeah. if there was ever an indicator, it was like, now yeah, you can, uh, like, the fact of how ridiculous it really is, you can you can right. completely see right through it right now. But I think what I really right. want to talk to, and um, this is going to get kind of deep, um, but we yeah, just, I'd like to go there in terms of philosophy, um, because I know there's an avid poet and a philosopher in you as well, which, you know, I, I really mm. love. And <laughs> there's a whole conversation in dance to be had around, you know, like, how much to envision and how much like the depth of philosophy and poetry and art really helps create the world that we see outside. Um, but I want to talk yeah. about the idea of like inevitable peace. You know, you mentioned this briefly, right. and uh, going back to the beginning of the conversation, you know, you said the importance mm -hmm. of holding on to a belief as well. You know, like yep. you hold on to a belief, you've got to believe that like new kind's going to happen. Yep. You've got that belief intrinsically that you know what. However the ships fall, it's going to happen. I'm showing up. I'm taking yeah. it. And is that, totally. is that what you see with inevitable peace as well? Because it's, you know, mm -hmm. when you say that, it's, it, it feels revolutionary. Like when I can, I can feel yeah. that it's like, you know, no one is really, people pray for peace, but no one really goes, actually, peace mm. is inevitable. Like it's, it's a matter of time that it's, we're going to yeah. do that. Tell me about that. <laughs> <laughs> when, um, 
when I was a, when I was a kid growing up in Townsville, my parents um, had day jobs, but they also ran a, a restaurant in the evenings. And I used to help out as a you know, 9, 10, 11 year old um, at the front counter. Um, and across from the front counter, pasted up on the, on the wall in front of me was a, was a sticker with a quote on it. And it was a Baha'i quote. And it said that peace is not only possible, but, possible, but it is inevitable. Um, and that sticker was just that message was emblazoned in my mind because I stared at it for so many hours of my life. <laughs> um, and it, and it is one of the, the core beliefs of the Baha'i faith is that, you know, it's not just possible, it's inevitable. It's, it's where we're headed to. It's been the point and purpose of everything we've ever gone through. Now, whether you look at it on a, on a spiritual sense, um, or in a, in a engineering mathematics kind of physics sense, um, which law of thermodynamics is it that all systems will return to equilibrium? I, I can't remember which law it was, but I mean, that's kind of what we're going through is that we will inevitably return to equilibrium. We once were there, there was something added to, to the system, whether it, that, that was the free will of human beings, whether it was, you know, if you're a religious person, you might think it was the apple in, in, you know, in the Garden of Eden, whatever it is, something was added to this, to this pool of water and it's caused a disturbance. And we've gone from living in cohesion with our environment as separated um, you know, tribes and nations to a, an immense amount of trauma over the last you know, thousand or a couple of thousand years. But we are inevitably heading back to a place of equilibrium with a heightened sense of awareness, uh, enlightenment, um, and c- capacity and capabilities. Um, so, yeah, we are going to return to that place. Um, it's just a matter of going through the process uh, of getting there. Um, as I touched on earlier, inherently our nature is good, you know, and I don't care, um, you know, the, obviously different religious systems and faith systems have different beliefs, but I don't believe in this idea that we were born evil um, and that we have to suffer to become good. I believe we are born good and we do suffer at, at, through the process as well, but I think in our inherent nature is, is good um, mm-hmm. and that we strive for that. Um, we strive for peace. We, we seek it. Um, we are attracted to it. Um, so as a society, even though we are going through um, an immense amount of trauma, um, we're heading to a place of understanding and cohesion. And it's, we have to acknowledge how much things have changed in a very short period as well. I mean, the fact that we're you know, talking about sustainability now and renewable energies and solar power. And so we weren't talking about that 20, 30 years ago. I mean, some people were. Um, the fact that the Me Too movement has, has been an, a, another um, marker in this movement for gender equality, um, the fact that we've got tens of thousands of, uh, of youth hitting the streets um, to ask for climate action, um, all of these things are pointing to a very, very bright future. Um, and I have no doubt that we're getting there. The reason why I'm so um, in, in, like motivated to work on it with every ounce of my energy is because I want to, I want it to happen sooner. It's not that I have any doubt whether it's going to happen. I want it to happen sooner so we can stem the trauma so we can stem the blood flow and we can stop the injustice sooner. Because as you mentioned, we've got more than enough food to feed this planet like eight times over. Yeah. You know what I mean? It's not like we've just got enough food. We've got food to feed this planet eight times over and yet 80% of this world, lives off less than $10 a day. And most people have one meal in a day, you know, and we've got a small portion of the world having, you know, activated almond milk, you know, chia seed pudding for breakfast, um, focusing on, um, you know, self-improvement while 80% of the world lives off of one meal a day, usually rice. Um, and, you know, there's an Im- immense amount of imbalance um, happening. Um, so the reason why I'm so um, inspired to, to not, stop working and, and bring as many people on board as possible and, and empower them to make the change as well is because I can't stand to ha- watch this process happen slowly because there's a, a great number of people that are suffering through this process and I want to alleviate that as fast as I can. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing. I um, Yeah, so I would almost argue that perhaps new kind was inevitable. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, totally. Um, Just like Tesla was. Then. <laughs> like gender equality, it was all inevitable. Um, it was inevitable that kids would take to the streets to teach us. You know, it was inevitable that you know fifty thousand students would would quit school and, and for the day and, and take to the streets. All of these things were inevitable. Um, and uh, yeah, there was a certain element of, of free will in there that um, that we have to enact as individuals because history um, 
there is a line being drawn and, you know, and we have to decide which side of history we want to fall on. Um, you know, whether we're going to act on that uh, intuition um, to, to be of service or whether we're going to say it's too difficult and, and watch others do it. It's inevitable that we are headed towards um, a just, sustainable and peaceful society. We might as well add our energy towards that momentum. I love that, brother. So tell me more about where, you know, we've discussed a little bit about New Kind. What does the name New Kind mean to you? Um, it means letting go of what we had once believed in as mankind. You know, that I, the idea of, of using the word mankind to describe all human beings, obviously it's, um, it's patriarchal and, you know, um, a lot of words um, seem to do that. So we wanted to kind of flip the word mankind on its head um, and use new kind. Um, and it also was pointing to the fact that um, it, it inspires so much in so many different people. Like it's one of those words that you don't necessarily need to know anything about new kind, but as soon as you hear it, you're like, yes, I'm new kind, whatever that is, I'm, I'm, I'm there. You know? <laughs> <laughs> um, people come from all different walks of life, all different um, philosophies and education backgrounds and with all different types of ideas because new kind just inspires something in them because yeah, we are tired of the old systems uh, we are tired of the um, you know, male-dominated patriarchy, um, the capitalist system that causes injustice. Uh, we are tired of the media um, discussing rubbish that's not you know, significant um, and distracting us from the real issues that we need to be discussing. We're tired of all of that. And we, we've evolved to a point where um, the child's play that, that was, you know, was the norm 50 years ago is no longer acceptable to us, you know, the casual sexism and misogyny in the workplace or, you know, using disposable plastics and not thinking about it twice. Like that was, that, that's not acceptable anymore. So we do need to look forward. A new kind to me is just the idea of looking forward um, and reimagining how we can be, who we can be and, and how we can live with each other. Um, yeah. That's why we landed on that, on that word new kind um, as the title for it. What's the most exciting part about New Kind for you? The most exciting part? Yeah. Um, seeing the transformation that individuals go through in that period of, you know, five, six days. That is mind-blowing to think that people come there and, you know, some of them are really confident, some are really nervous, some don't know what to expect, some have a very clear idea what to expect, but regardless, people are transformed. Um, new connections are made not just with other people but in their brains you know the whole new world opened up because three extra dots were joined up and that's the most exciting thing for me and that's what um, I thrive on is seeing people's faces light up um, and their whole demeanor change over the course of a, of a you know very intimate 500 person kind of experience over five or six days um, and then seeing them months later or a year later and just seeing how their life completely, the trajectory has been completely shifted since that moment. That's incredibly exciting. Um, and it's something that I will never take for granted. Um, the people who come there um, totally inspire me to keep doing what I'm doing. Yo, sounds like an inspired evolution. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. Absolutely. Absolutely. Like, yeah, the festival has been growing every year. Um, you know, and not mm -hmm. just in a small, small feat like in, you know, every year it's, it's gaining a lot of momentum and a lot of traction. Yeah. Do you often take the time to think about where this is all going or do you stay as present as you can with it? Uh, I stay quite present with it. I, I, I used to get um, carried away with big like, ideas of five, ten years down a track and like, oh, it's going to be this and it's going to be an education facility and a university and we're going to have a media production company and you know, we're going to do magazines and, and podcasts and movies. And, and I'm like, you know what? It's like it's really easy to get carried away with that stuff. And mm -hmm. even though anyone literally can, can do anything, mm -hmm. you can't do everything. Yeah. You know, and even though you can do a lot of things, you can't do them all really well. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yeah. so it's like, yeah, you're totally, you know, you can do whatever you want in this world, and there's a good chance you can do a lot of different things, and we can change career paths really uh, often in our lives, you know, these days, more whereas we couldn't, you know, 20, 30 years ago. Um, but there's only a small number of things that you can do really well. Um, so I've learned uh, to now focus my energies on, on less things and do them better than, you know, wanting to do all of the things that I was doing um, in the past. So 
Um, I stay present with it. I try and make sure that the experience that I'm creating for the 500 people that are showing up is the best experience that I can possibly make for them. Um, and then I let, you know, that experience and that word of mouth, um, and the energy from that event to reverberate and for, for that to then tell the universe what I'm doing and the universe to feed back to me and say, cool, that's what you did. This is what we're going to give back to you as energy or compensation or whatever. Um, so I don't think too far uh, about, um, what might happen in five or 10 years from now, because let's be honest, who knows what the world's going to look like in, you know, four years from now, much less 10. Um, the exponential rate of change that we're going through. I mean, we've seen more change in the last 15 years than we have in the last, you know, 150 almost. Mm-hmm. Um, and the next five years is going to be as much change as we've seen in the last, you know, 15 to 20. Um, so if we, if we look at that trajectory, it, we, we are peaking soon and there's going to be an immense amount of change happening. So who's to tell what the world's going to look like? I'm just going to do my bit right now. <laughs> yeah, and I think uh, just what you were talking to was like the biggest reason that I was super excited to come and talk at Newkind this year was basically to try and, you know, just like, because I think emotional resilience is something that's mm. really, really necessary for this time that is so transitional. 100%. Right? And mental well-being, you know, and those are two things I was really passionate to share. But unfortunately, I won't be able to make it this year, but it was always easy. I'm super keen so good. to make that. I'll happen. cover you. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, it's um, yeah, it's such a such a potent potent time ahead. So I've got some questions just to just sit down. Mm. You don't have to have the answers to them. These are just questions that burn in the back of my head when I think about a lot of yeah. the future of mankind and you know, new kind and what's coming up. Um, mm. Do you think like population will continue to like? forever grow or do you think that at some point we will curb the population because I kind of see you know the way we grow and develop as being mm. you know unsustainable in my humble perspective mm. I think that's probably like yeah. one of the biggest things um that I see as being like a key to the sustainability of the you know yeah. the whole world enacted a one-child policy obviously you know it's like a free will sort of debate as well on, on yeah the but you know you look at what happens when you know just to give you a small example in my day-to-day experience you know China has a one-child policy I look at yeah. all the um, international students I was friends with at university. They seem to be very well compensated, living very well, because obviously all the resources that were previously for two families have been funneled into one, you know? And mm. these kids, are, are like all these individuals are living very well, heavily resourced lives, and they're, you know, they're, they're quite happy, they're quite content. Um, and, uh, you know, there's less people on the planet in that space, you know? Yeah. So what are your thoughts on stuff like that? Um. I mean, when we understand the scope of the injustice currently being played out in society, mm. um, like fully, then I think it begins to become clear that it's not on the number of people that's the issue. Mm. Um, and that's kind of what we were speaking about before, about the, the resources that we need to feed the planet. We, we feed the planet eight times over every year. Yeah. There's more food on this planet to feed eight times what we have on this current planet right now. Um, but that mostly goes to feeding animals that we then slaughter. So the issue with climate and one of the greatest impacts, uh, the influences of climate change is actually animal agriculture and the methane that they produce creates a greenhouse effect that warms up the planet uh, more so than all, you know, transport and industry combined. So it's not the number of planet, uh, number of people on this planet that is the issue. It's the resources that a very small percentage of privileged societies are using. Um, so even though um, China has got, you know, a, a billion or so people, two billion people, the average American uses 20 to 30 times more resources than a Chinese resident. Um, and, you know, about 30 or to 40 times more than the average Indian citizen. So it's like the amount of stuff we're going through in a day-to-day basis, the amount of packaging, the amount of fuel, the, the amount of water that goes into producing a single kilogram of animal meat to eat. Um, these are the, the issues we really need to be addressing because if we were to be using renewable energies, solar power, and eating a plant-based diet, just those two things, we'd be able to populate this planet so many times more over. And we don't need immense parcels of land to graze large livestock to then kill them and and get a few kilograms of meat from their bodies. You know what I mean? Growing plant-based diets takes a much smaller amount of water, land, and resources um, and then the energy we use to power our homes and to power our vehicles um, and to fly around like a single flight from, let's say, uh, Brisbane to Hobart right, um, uses like for an individual uses over half a ton, releases over half a ton of carbon. 
You know what I mean? That's an immense amount of carbon they're reducing in, in one flight. So it's, I don't think the issue is public uh, population or population growth. I think it, the issue is the resources that we're using as, uh, as a privileged Western society. Um, that's what needs to be addressed because we could cull the population down if we wanted to. Let, let's say we cull it down to 2 billion people. But if the economic construct was still flawed, if the, um, the way in which we are feeding ourselves and housing ourselves was still flawed, then we'd still get to a place where we're destroying the planet. And it doesn't take many people, as we're seeing, you know, half a billion people can destroy the planet, <laughs> you know, if we're using too much shit. Um, so I think that's what the issue is. I think we need to address imbalances in, in, in our systems and, and redesign better uh, economic uh, systems. Um, and it kind of takes for us to get to this sort of a size before we can see the issues. So kind of like the Leaning Tower of Pisa situation, if you've got a slight imbalance at the base, you don't notice it until you've built on that tower quite a bit. So our constructs economically that worked when the population was smaller, when transport was by, sh by ship and by ocean, you know, when manufacturing wasn't so heightened and they rapid, um, the problems couldn't be witnessed. But once you accelerate that process and people um, are consuming more and faster and traveling faster and communicating faster and we're using up more stuff, then that's when the problems can be seen in the system. You're like, ah, oh, okay, you, but we needed to get to this rate and pace for us to see the original problems in the system. Um, so, yeah, if we cut the population, we might get to some sort of relative peace, but the actual system is what's flawed, not the number of people. You right, know? So you're um, saying it's a, it's a symptom, it's not the root. Um, it's not the root. Totally. The root cause is the fact that we've got people dying from obesity and famine at the same time. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's the absurdity, absurdity of the world we're living in. Yeah. So I think um, something that came up for me while you were mentioning that was this idea of convenience. You know, like obviously a lot of what we do, a lot of the programs and the habits and the behaviours that we have installed are fundamentally mm. based on things like convenience. You know, it's mm, totally. Like just a small, like small example, it's inconvenient to <laughs> throw a plastic bag through the shops and just pick one up there. You know, mm. um, and thankfully now I think I'm not sure if it's Australia wide, but now there's no plastic bags in any of the supermarkets, which is an absolute blessing. Mm. That's how I'm getting there, but yeah. here we are nonetheless. Totally. Um, right. But yeah, and I, I sort of like when you were mentioning the Leaning Tower of Pizza. You know, I was wondering if like I, this this imagery in my head was like it's kind of convenient to sort of just leave it, you know, and just let it tilt, you know. For, <laughs> but, then, but then at what point? <laughs> tilting too hard that you go actually this is more than this is actually going to become an even bigger right experience. and are we totally yes yeah. we're at that point now where we're starting to realize yeah. that you know what was convenient previously is going to become like mm. pretty convenient pretty soon absolutely totally yeah, yeah exactly that that tower is leaning really hard right now um and it's about to collapse and there's certain people that are trying to convince us that the tower is fine um mm. and there's certain people who are building a new tower with stronger foundations. Mm. Um, so yeah, the, the tower will crumble um, and the, the injustice in the system um, will see, you know, it see its own end. Um, so we don't need to necessarily push it any harder for it to fall. Um, when, when a system is flawed, it will collapse eventually. <laughs> and it's just taken, you know, 150 years of it being accelerated really fast for us to do this. Um, so I feel as though the, energy should be put towards the new tower that's being built. Um, and yeah, some of the conveniences that we um, have been accustomed to won't exist in that new place. Um, you know, we've gone, <laughs> it's, it's, when you really think about it, it really is absurd to think it's taken us this long to get plastic bags out of shopping centers. And then, but then here's the thing, like what about the stuff we're putting in our carry bags? Like they're completely wrapped in plastic now. It's like, can we, like yeah. how slowly do we have to go through this painful process? Can we just not get, yeah, right? Like, yeah, I'm going to go and buy my vegan sausages wrapped in packaging or my meat wrapped in packaging or, you know, my muesli bars wrapped in packaging, all these things, my fruit and vegetable wrapped in plastic packaging and styrofoam tray. It's like, it's ridiculous. So it's like, we need to start making bigger leaps, you know, to just ban plastic bags and keep, you know, our, um, our carry bags and fill that with plastic stuff and, and plastic bottles of soft drink and all this other stuff. That's ridiculous. We need to take bigger leaps and be able to give up um, can, things that we thought were convenient that are actually leading us to our own, you know, uh, deaths really. The, the food that we're eating, if it's coming in plastic wrapping, eight, nine times out of 10, you probably shouldn't be putting it in your body anyway. 
you know, mm. like we don't need so much processed food uh, to be manufactured for us uh, for yeah, millions of years. We thrived on plant-based diets, right? Yeah, that comes back to the health stuff as well. You know, the minute your, your mm. food's like apples in contact with plastic, absorbing the estrogen from the plastic, they're disrupting your hormones, you know. Right. It's on every level, you know, that it's, it's insidious. Um, like what happened to fruits and vegetables, bro? <laughs> like, can we not just eat fruits? I don't need a reason to buy. Just give me an apple. <laughs> um, abundance is so difficult to market, though, bro. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Ah, just plant an apple tree in your backyard. <laughs> yeah, it's um, yeah, it's it's interesting. As you were mentioning, um, as you were talking before. Um, the one thing that sort of came to me was kind of like a morbid thought and it's kind of the idea of, you know, humans will eventually become extinct anyway, right? So at some point we are, you know, going to leave this earth some way, shape, form, matter, other. The thing for me that keeps mm. me going is I really feel life is sacred. I really feel life is a blessing. Life is an opportunity. One of my biggest mm. values is celebration. You know, it's just the fact that yeah. the fact that we're here, let's just celebrate that existence is here because we're like, it's such a mystery. Mm. It's like, you know, and this is right. super metaphysical, super existential, but I don't know how mm. that, I don't, I just don't get how I can sit here over, mm. even if it wasn't for digital waves, how I can just sit here and hear my own thoughts being spoken. Like, how do I get thoughts? You know, the fact that I'm an organism <laughs> as this experience yeah. is such a blessing, you know, so my mission is to try and celebrate as hard as I can for as long as I can, you know, just the, totally. the, the, sanctity, yeah. the sanctity of life. Um, so it's mm-hmm. not really a thought of my own that, you know, like life will always, like life is all going to dissolve anyway. Um, but I think that encourages mm-hmm. celebration nature within me a little bit for sure. You know, it's like mm-hmm. while I'm here, let's make the most of what we've got for sure. And let's try and make it the most beautiful. Yeah. So what would you have to say to those that are like on the more archaic, like, you know, maybe archaic is a pretty loaded term. Sorry for using that. But, um, you know, like (laughs) of a different, (laughs) of a a, a, a mentality that, you know, things are already going to like going their natural progression towards, you know, the the, the tower is going to crumble anyway. Like you said, we're building a new Mm -hmm. tower, jump on board. Yeah. yeah, what do you have to, what would you say to people that are in that space? It's like, you know, I don't, I don't really need to give a, give a shit about where my waste goes or I don't really need to give a shit about mm-hmm. my consumption behavior because everything's going yeah. to go eventually anyway. Yeah, okay, cool. Uh, I've got uh, a few ideas uh, to express on that point. Um, I, meant, I touched on it earlier and I said very briefly how reaching sustainability um, and justice in society is, is deeply connected to our spiritual progress. Um, and to our our existence as, in, a, in a whole sense, and to become engaged with this issue, with this process, is an absolute privilege and honor, and such a massive blessing to be alive in a day and age where we can look at some of the um, some of the things were complete that were com- considered completely normal in the past, and to be able to look at them with new eyes and see the injustice in them, and to be able to see how. Uh, how much we can create a fairer world and to be able to witness this world the way we are today is such a blessing because to have been born 50 or 60 or 100 years ago would have been a different world completely. So to become engaged with this process is an honor. And if someone doesn't want to, that's okay. I'm, I'm like, that's for them to decide. Um, I see this as such an incredible opportunity to be involved in some way, shape or form with this process of creating a sustainable, just, peaceful, kind, compassionate, um, symbiotic society that is based on principles of love rather than fear um, and that the the needs of the whole are considered before the needs of the individual. And like that is just an incredibly beautiful thing to witness and um, I would feel sorry for someone who doesn't want to be, become a part of that. And I would encourage anyone who's sitting on the sidelines to see it in that sort of a perspective. Um, the idea that, you know, life on earth might end as well. You touched on that briefly. I want to speak to that as well. If, if I was to identify with my own physical body and my own identity and my ego and this name and the story, then technically my life would, would only last 70 or 80 years. You know, and I think it's that idea um, that this is my life and that's all my life is that's actually causing, it's at the root of a lot of the problems that we have is because we think that we 
are an individual life separate from the larger life and that somehow our individual cell within the larger organism is more significant than the other cells because I published three books uh, and the other cell didn't publish three books. The fact of the matter is I'm a, I'm a single blood cell in the body. Um, and when we begin identifying with the body, which is the larger existence of life as a whole, um, whether it's life on this planet or life throughout this universe, when you make that connection and that, that you know, those lines are joined, yeah. those dots are joined together. I firmly believe then, we're all nodes in a network. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's it. Then you see the, in the eternity, the, in the infinity of it all, and you realize this is never going to end. There is no end to this life. You know, <laughs> like it's just a process. And, and, and this body that on this earth is literally just a baby that's being born. And before we are born, we need to just make sure that we're fully formed. <laughs> you know? That's all it is. So if my individual blood cell, which is this body air fine, happens to pass away, that's not the end of life. And it's not the end of life in any sense at all. Um, and that's what I like to inspire people towards is to see themselves as connected to all existence. We are not separate beings from the oxygen that we breathe and the trees that give us that oxygen and the food that we eat. It's, it's one thing. And if you want to consider your connectivity to the environment or nature and how important it is, you know, I suggest you hold your breath for five minutes while you think about it. Yeah. <laughs> um, even, even, you know, like connecting to your breath, like, you know, when you think right. about like what you're referring to is the continuum, <laughs> the continuum you know, like the right. whole idea that, you know, life is one big continuum. Like we are breathing, and this is something that, you know, I've learned from the indigenous South American culture. I've been, I love traveling to South America. But they, mm. they always mention, you know, like you're breathing the same air of your ancestors. Right. You know, and yeah. it's like it's it's incredible, right? breath. and life is, and like if you, like you said, if you hold your breath for five minutes, you check out. You know, so like, what, yeah. like what's keeping you in existence is the same as what your ancestors, you know, have mm -hmm. firing and respiring back in and out. I, I, I flippantly said something yesterday, um, and then instantly the the re, like the immensity of that statement really struck home. I I was saying to a friend that all I need is is oxygen and Wi Fi. Right, <laughs> really, <laughs> and then in the same 2018, <laughs> and, then, and, and then I realized as soon as I said that that what I meant was all I need is breath and connectivity, yeah, <laughs> yeah. right? Yeah. That's really all we need. Like, once yeah. we realize our connectivity with the rest of the world, mm -hmm. yeah, and that's the scary thing about being out of a Wi Fi zone or reception <laughs> is because we lose connectivity, yeah, <laughs> all we really want is breath and connectivity. And when we see that connectivity with the rest of life, with the rest of the universe, with our, with our fellow bus riders, you know, with our community, when we see that connectivity and we foster that, then nothing is scary. Nothing is too, over, you know, too much trouble or overwhelming because you're never ever alone in the universe ever. Once you see that, you're like, oh, I'm connected to all life that has ever been. Uh, I'm not alone. Um, and that's all we really need to focus on is that foster that idea of connectivity with everything. And that will foster ideas of responsibility and love and compassion and kindness. But first we've got to get back to the breath and then foster that connectivity. So it's Amazing. oxygen and Wi-Fi. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm about to die of battery. I'm going to recharge this. Give me two secs. Totally. Yo. <laughs> having conversations that are more passionate, um, like just to have that extended conversation. So we'll <laughs> go from here. Totally. Yeah, you can yeah, confess as you want. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So man, connectivity is such a um, is such a deep thing, and I think even with meditation and you know some of the work that you know influences a lot of what I do. Um, you know, mm. connection to breath, connection is to your innate nature and that connection to like mm. maybe even your in, your in your soul, you know, the word inspired for me means a lot, you know, it's like taking in breath, but also connects mm. you to your spirit, which is a fundamentally connection to nature. Um, yeah. Right. So I think is that like, if you were to sum up, you know, new kind in a couple of words, in a couple of pillars, like are you really trying to bring people together to connect to themselves, to nature, and to an, a greater awareness? Like, tell us about what your, like, intention for New Kind is. 
Yeah, I, I feel like those things are important things. Connectivity to self, to, to, to spirit, to one another, one another and to nature. Um, and there's definitely elements of that. Um, I feel like there's been a great emphasis on that, though, in society. So there is um, a, and a great deal of uh, energy put into um, you know, self-care, connectivity, breath work. There's a lot of that happening right now. Um, yep. And I don't, want, I don't want to pretend like I can do that better than those who are already doing it. Um, so although that is an element of new kind, I feel new kind is a place for those who have got that idea and that, that sentiment of connectivity who are doing their daily practice, who are either practicing their breath work or, um, you know, are interested in, um, issues of a, of a global kind of, um, perspective to come to new kind to then work out what next. That's what new kind is. Um, so you know, we do have breath work in the mornings, we do have meditation and, and yoga, or you can go to a CrossFit, you know, workout if you want, like we've got morning practice stuff for everyone. Um, but the programming during the day, um, has parts of, you know, we've got yoga for activism. We've got, um, you know, breath work for, for a conscious life, but also next to that, we've got like, um, you know, economic injustice. Is it a design flaw or inevitability? Um, uh, so, for, for me, new kind is, it, it incorporates elements of connectivity um, and oneness with, with all, of course. Um, mm-hmm. But it's also about the, the, the logical, mental as well. It's like, cool, uh, deep ecology, ecofeminism, economic justice, gender equality, politics, policy, app development, how to start an NGO, you know, how does an NGO function? How do you impact policy and government? Um, you know, what, how do we raise better children? Like the actual practical things, that's, that's what new kind is about. Um, so we make space for the, the spiritual side of it. Um, but we definitely, uh, emphasize the practical side of it as well, because that's kind of what we need. Um, there is the possibility of falling into the, the cult of self, uh, of, of self care at times. And we try and uh, avoid that and to awaken people from that. Um, just to focus on the individual self um, can be poisonous to the, to the individual cell. Um, you have to focus on your own health and your well-being, and do your breath work and have your chia seed pudding, but then also go and read Noam Chomsky and go to a rally. You know what I mean? Like do all of it together. <laughs> you know? and, uh, yeah. you know, stop, using plastic, stop using plastics as well as attending lectures on economic justice and yeah. do all of those things at the same time. Um, so we're not trying to... Um, squeeze ourselves into uh, a position that's already been filled. We're trying to create, like fill a gap in the, in the, um, in the events kind of industry um, where we can cater to those who are like, yep, I've got it. I know what you're about. Now, how do I go about changing the world? Yeah. Um, and that's what we hope you kind of. How do I empower myself further to take the next right. action that I know yeah. I need to take, but I may not know exactly how. Right. Amazing. For those tuning in, um, also I find just mentioned Noam Chomsky, um, and I noticed on on the schedule as well for this year, the uh, Requiem of an American Dream is screening first. Totally. Time. <laughs> a bit of a, a bit of a hobby. So yeah. for those tuning in that actually can't make may not be able to make it to New Fan Festival, that is definitely worth viewing. Um, mm. Requiem of an American 100%. Dream, a great little totally. entry, and Noam Chomsky is one of just an amazing mind, and he puts together twelve. Points and he just nails them so succinctly in terms of what's going on. So beautifully, to be, yeah. To be addressed, um, yeah. Requiem of the American Dream. I'll put it in the show notes for everybody to to touch base. That'd be amazing. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I uh, there's a there's a personal question I want to ask you, bro, and <laughs> in public, <laughs> as we do. Um, but it's kind of along the lines of you know, I often you know just from a bit of a philosophical standpoint, look at, um, you know, the fact that there is so much, and I think we were speaking to this before, you know, the the whole, you know, there's all these people that are are malnourished and then there's all these people that are obese at the same time. But I kind of Mm. look at the idea of if there weren't so many, like if society didn't have its troubles, right, Mm. there wouldn't be the opportunity for individuals like yourself and myself to band together. Mm. You know, so, yeah. Do you ever look at that perspective of it as well? It's like the hundred percent every day, <laughs> every day, hundred percent. So it's it's unfair, it's unjust, it's painful, it's all those things. Granted, mm. but how on how else are we to grow? I mean, mm. it's 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 just the way this this universe, this world is designed that we grow through hardships. We yeah. we grow through 
through strain and through trauma. Now, whether it's emotional trauma or whether it's physical trauma, like when you go into the gym and you're lifting, uh, you're, bench, you're benching more than you did last week, that's trauma, bro. Those muscles yeah. are tearing. You know? <laughs> and it's only in, the, only in the repairing of that muscle tear that it grows. You know, it tears and repairs and tears and repairs and that's trauma on a physical level. Um, and that's how it's, we, we sculpt our bodies. Um, mentally, um, it's through focus and attention and discipline and all those things that seem like they're quite difficult and traumatic at times that we grow and we develop our mental capacities. Emotionally, it's the same. Um, we, we clean our hearts, we expand our hearts, we make them more connected and capable of holding much more by going through painful cleansing processes and trauma. Um, and in all of those three cases, too much can break us also. So that's why resilience, as you mentioned earlier, is so important to me. And I run resilience training seminars. If you try and bench 150 kilograms before you've done 140 safely, then you're crazy. You know? And you'll cause yourself physical, physical pain. Um, so we see in times and instances in, in our lives uh, or as a society where an immense blow has been dealt and the body wasn't capable of dealing with it, whether it's an emotional trauma a mental trauma or a physical trauma. So we have to build up our resilience to be able to carry more load in all of those three different areas uh, gradually and slowly. Um, and once we see it as a process of, of growth, then the pain becomes joy. And you, you, when you feel that tightness in your chest the next morning after the gym, you don't cry about it. You're like, oh, that's so sore. I'm going to grow. And then we're going to look at them all the same way. You know, we're like, ah, oh, that person just totally destroyed my ego. And I'm going to grow right now. I'm going to breathe. <laughs> <laughs> you know? Because the other option is to go and have a sook about it, you know, and to become resentful and to point at that person and say, that person hurt me and that person hurt me. But look, that's not growing. Um, so, yeah, I think we need to flip uh, how we think about, you know, comfort and convenience um, and, and what the point of life is really. Um, and it's not to, to create comfort and convenience for ourselves. It's to be comfortable in, um, in situations of difficulty and, and through hardships and to show um, composure through um, tests and to show calm through periods of turbulence. And that's what makes life so beautiful um it's those moments for ourselves when we see others doing it you know that's what inspires us when we see someone standing up to an injustice or when we see someone um come up through you know against completely um you know unimaginable odds come up and like just shine through that's what inspires us to continue growing and learning and um yeah i think if we just focus a bit more on that then it won't seem so difficult to be on this planet right now, which it can seem at times. <laughs> mm, amazing. Thank you for sharing. So what I was gathering from that, which I kind of relate to, is that, you know, the, the meaning of life is growth. Um, mm -hmm. having, the, having the temperance, having the grace almost to sort of mm. muster the strength and the courage to withstand your growth. Totally, yeah, and to, to, to choose it willingly, to say that's going to be a difficult path, but I'm going to do that because otherwise I'm going to become weak and soft and, you know, and I'm not going to be of service to humanity, but to, to willingly choose the path that you already know is going to be harder. <laughs> I mean, yeah. That's true courage. I mean, courage is not to, to, to not be afraid, but it's to do things while you're afraid. Mm. You know? um, so I see difficulties and hardships in the same way as that. Search them out, seek them out, find out the next thing that's going to be uncertain or, or, or testing or difficult and do that um, and let that be your guide because that will ensure that you're always growing and that you're always contributing to life in some way um, and that you're always developing yourself spiritually. Um, and that really is the essence of life is to grow and evolve and to constantly change um, and to always adapt to its environment. I mean, that's what we've been doing for Billions of years, <laughs> you know. Why stop now? All of a sudden, <laughs> <laughs> eating in cars with climate control. Because it's, it's convenient. it's <laughs> convenient not to. <laughs> 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 to shield ourselves from the elements and be fed four times a day. And it's just like, I need that. We never really used to. <laughs> oh, man. Yeah, no, I, 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 really that. I really appreciate that. And I, um, I know I could sit here and I could talk to you forever. I've got a few couple of last things <laughs> to sort of, you know, tie off the episode because it's going to have to happen. Yeah. Time. 
but we will definitely, you know, continue this on another date and another channel. Totally. But what I really want to ask you now is who are some of your greatest inspirations in the world and the way that, you know, we're working forward? Um, oh, I've got so many diverse inspirations. <laughs> I don't... I don't like look up to certain individual people um, and, and, and idolize an individual. Um, I like to, um, yeah, I'm not one a person who's um, like, like, like wowed by celebrity or like idolizes individual people. So I, I would look at the tenacity of Einstein and the tenacity of the homeless person to continue living as, as both as inspirational, you know? So I, I look at human beings and they inspire me every day. Um, the, the, the single mother of three, you know, feeding, clothing, bathing a kid, taking them to school and do, doing what, two jobs that inspires me. Um, people who stood up and at times throughout history, um, to, to point out injustice, you know, whether it was a civil rights movement in America, um, Rosa Parks or Malcolm X, or whether it was, you know, indigenous Australian activists, um, whether it was, um, scientists who just lived completely, you know, poverty stricken lives, just for the sake of science and, and development and medicine, um, this like every everyone inspires me. Um, I look at the great teachers of the world, um, you know, whether it was Christ, Muhammad, um, Buddha, Baha'u'llah, all of the great founders of these systems of, of, of faith, they all suffered a great deal to be able to, to, to share what was in essence a message of peace. You know, what's been done in their names, let's put that aside, but as individuals, they went through an immense amount of, of, of testing and trials and tribulations at the hands of people who weren't ready to hear their message. Mm -hmm. um, they inspire me because, I mean, what does they care? They just wanted the, the, the peace and security of humanity. Um, and they could have just been like, oh, don't worry, you don't want to hear it, or I'll leave you to it. But no, they insisted. <laughs> you know, they insisted to speak Steve the message. Just goes that back maybe. to making cabinets. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, no worries. I'm going to make a good job. Um, but yeah, I think in essence, people who are willing to stand up for something that others might not yet be ready for, but they know is the right thing. That's what inspires me. Those who look into the future and say, hey, let's go that way um, and are willing to face the difficulties and hardships that come with that, um, they inspire me. Yeah. Amazing. Thank you for sharing, brother. And um, in terms of evolution, um, I know uh, having this conversation with you, I think life is one big journey of evolution and you kind of embrace that. Mm -hmm. um, but is there like some tools or something in particular? Um, I know you said, you know, perhaps feeling fear and moving towards it anyway, um, like mm -hmm. as, a, as a thing of courage. Are there some tools along your evolution that, you know, are tried and tested and you sort of lean into quite a bit? Yeah, developing a really heightened sense of, uh, of self-awareness. Um, and by that, I mean being aware of your emotions while you're feeling them. And be like, oh, why, why did I just feel that? Because that person said this. Like being aware of that. Not like self-awareness in a really abstract kind of spiritual way, but like practical self-awareness and, and being able to like um, witness your own thoughts from, uh, as if you're outside your thoughts. Witness your emotions and, and to, to assess them. Um, and to reflect on your actions every day at the end of the day and think, well, how did I respond to these situations? How could I have responded? Why did I speak like that to that person? You know, and when, when I was like really kind to the one before, why did that person trigger me? That type of self-awareness helps mm. us to evolve much faster. Um, witnessing and reflecting on our thoughts and, uh, and our emotions as if it was an external person. And that type of awareness of the self from outside helps us to, um, so yeah, like to, to filter out um, practices and behaviors that aren't benefiting us or that are hurting other people uh, or, are, or are holding us back. You know, sometimes we're not aware of how our manner of speaking in a certain circumstance is actually holding our career back. But then if you watch it from the outside and look at how you're responding to your boss as opposed to your colleagues, you, know, you might pick up something, you know. Yeah. Um, that definitely helps me. Um, silence as well. I think that's... <laughs> I mean, we've been chatting for an hour and a half, but after this, <laughs> I, I didn't say a word for the next four hours, you know. Yeah. Um, I live a very um, um, solitary life, um, and uh, even though I'm quite active, the, m the majority of my days are spent um, in silence, um, and that's where my thoughts kind of coalesce and come together, and 
you know, I, I depend on that silence like I depend on oxygen to be able to have clear thoughts and to be sure of what I'm saying when I'm saying it um, and to, to make sense in conversations is, is all of that alone time in the shower, um, you know, in nature, um, whether you're walking, running, driving, just spend time without external stimuli so that your body and your mind has got time to process what you're going through because we're going through a lot of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, I love you things. so much. <laughs> I would say those two are like the leading yeah. that I use, for sure. I love you. Thank you so much for sharing that. So <laughs> now I've got the um, a question is, if we could erect a billboard that was completely at your whim to design, in the middle of Times mm-hmm. Square, New York, right? All that energy, all mm. those people would be witness to um, your billboard. What would, and it would be there forever, all right? What would wow. it read? What would it read? I would probably spend weeks thinking about it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, <that's right. laughs> like, I'm such a considered person. I would spend so much time thinking about that and like <laughs> I'd go through so many options. Um, be kind are the two words that just came to me just then. Literally, as soon as you're saying billboard, I thought of the words, be kind. Yeah. And if people could just look at that and just dwell on those two words, just be kind and to allow that to influence their days. Mm. Oh, wow. I mean, if we could just show kindness to one another, um, it, would, it would just change the way we behave. If we were kinder to our, ourselves, you know, we would think differently about ourselves. If we were kinder to our families, we would live more, more cohesive family lives. If we were kinder to nature, we wouldn't be destroying it as, as fast as we are. I think kindness um, is, is really important to me. Yeah. Another reason why we added those two words, new and kind, together as well. <laughs> I love that. I love that. Um, but yeah, there's so many messages. I'm, I'm constantly jotting down ideas that I would like to see on billboards. Like I've got notebooks full of t-shirt ideas of things that I would say. Um, you know, uh, things like uh, the trespassers will be fed, bathed, and given a place to rest, <laughs> as opposed to prosecuted. <laughs> um, you know, um, welcome. <laughs> <laughs> you know, just flip all of these old paradigm ideas on on their heads, yeah. um, and I, I feel like our, our chests. Uh, uh, a daily billboards, which is why I pay a lot of attention. I love the fact that you're wearing an Aspire Evolution um, mm-hmm. T-shirt. I'm wearing my Amnesty hoodie. Mm-hmm. I feel like uh, we should constantly be using our bodies as, as, as message boards every mm-hmm. day, all the time. Um, and, yeah, be really aware of the messages we're spreading on, on our clothing. Um, but, yeah, maybe I'll, I would just firstly propose to be kind and then I'll probably spend three weeks thinking about other ideas. <laughs> <laughs> Before we have to go up in Times Square. <laughs> I, um, yeah, just while we're talking about kindness, I just want to share, you know, um, I've been thinking about this one a lot recently, actually. Um, and I feel like it's, like gratitude has been a massive part of my life. Um, mm. for, you know, yeah, quite some time now, uh, many years. And I think kindness is kind of the next big thing for me, touch wood. Mm. Um, and I share that from a place like, getting a bit vulnerable but I started to notice that um some of the conversations I have especially with my most intimate loved ones um Mm. I speak to them I speak to them quite curtly um and it's not Mm. rude it's just direct you know right um and I've had the opportunity to sit back and go actually that's not how I wanted to communicate with that person Mm. And then I yeah. found, wait, why did I communicate to that person that way? When to people like outside of that inner most, right. like I generally am much kinder. And so I realized, the circle, yeah. yeah, and then I realized actually I'm so comfortable with that person that I'm actually communicating right. to them exactly the same way right. that I communicate yes. to myself. Yes, yes. You know? And so totally. it was like, uh, so I, yeah. yeah, and again, this is the same age old story. It starts that's with awesome. you, you know, but that's right. really what I'm coming to, you know. It's like, that's an amazing level of self-awareness to, to, to pick up on that, to notice that how you're talking with those that are most close to your loved ones is how you speak to yourself. Mm. Um, and that's, that's incredible. And that's one of those, you know, the, the, the gifts of, of being aware of ourselves to that sort of a level is to pick up on those things. And that's, yeah, super important. Um, to, to recognize that I, I had a, a, a thought along those lines uh, with regards to how we speak to different groups of people. And I remember once reflecting on how I would speak with those who I was deeply in love with. 
you know, when you're, when you're in that, you know, that the early phases and you're, and you're writing poetry and, you know, you're all gushy around each other and all that sort of stuff. Like, and how close do we pay attention to their words when we sit just sitting across the table having coffee with them and how we, we like just love their sound of their accents and all those things. And we're just like full present just because we love them and we want them to love us. Absolutely. Imagine if we spoke to everyone like we loved them like that. <laughs> <laughs> Like imagine we give everyone our attention, like that, like we were like a paper loving lover who was just like, what, "What have you got to say to me right now?" <laughs> How much ease and calm would that bring to people's hearts? You know, and how much kinder would they be in turn to other people if we were able to give them the presence that we always craved, that we may or may not have got from our from our parents or from our lovers and loved ones, from our siblings, um, and I think. Yeah, children just want that, really. And, and mm. as adults, we often grow up reali- not realizing that that's all we still want. <laughs> you know, even as 30, 40, 50-year-olds, all we really want is for someone to look at us with complete love and openness and, and presence and to listen to what we have to say. Mm. Wouldn't that be transformative? <laughs> oh, absolutely. Um, that opens up a question that I've been wanting to ask you, um, which is holding space. You know, just holding space for one another and I think just what you're reflecting then is like you know the energy of if we were just to sit with love and witness each other with love like the space if yeah. we could hold that for each other just how much that would transform people because I totally. you know like I know that's an individual concept but the reality of the situation is also that you know as kind of the spearhead at new kind you know I know it's a lot of people mm. and you're not the type to take all the credit for it at you know you're holding a lot of space for new kind yeah um yeah yeah just to create you know holding space and what that means to you yeah yeah I've, I've, i mean a lot of people use that that word that term holding space um and it's you know it's come into the um vernacular and you know it's, it's, it's a catchphrase um but i feel like holding space oftentimes um also needs to be connected to holding our tongues um and people f- like confuse holding space with like trying to fix something or do something for someone. Whereas it's just like, just being like being able to allow whoever it is, the individual or the group to, to do what they need to do to say what they need to say. And, um, and it's, it doesn't require ad- advice or, um, a response and oftentimes I've seen people try and hold space for me or for others um, and you can see their brains working while they're listening to someone mm-hmm. trying to come up with, a, with the most you know authentic genuine um, uh, intelligent response and I'm like well <laughs> you're not holding space because you're trying to solve the problem they're just discussing yeah. you, know, you just need to listen and, mm-hmm. and maybe just sit silence and like yeah I don't know how to fix that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, and then for things like Newkind, as big as Newkind, well, yeah, holding that space, um, there's a bit, it's, it, it's not like one-on-one kind of holding space. It's more like takes an immense amount of energy to be able to bring those things together and to, uh, to, to hold it and allow it to do its thing. You know, when sometimes, um, even though they're all for the cause of social justice, they might not, they might be like magnets, you know, when, when two North ends of a magnet meet, they don't want to touch, you know? Mm-hmm. So you, you're trying to bring in people from like seemingly disparate social justice movements and you're trying to pull them all together and weave this thing together. And they're like, no, no, no this is the most important thing. And then someone else is like, no, this is the most important thing. And everyone's kind of like half agreeing with others, but not, fully aligned so it takes an immense amount of energy for the entire organizing team to hold that space physically during the event and philosophically throughout the year as we, you know in our conversations and discussions and connecting you know uh, animal rights with the deep ecology movement with the climate change movement with economic justice you know and when people haven't quite made those connections for themselves yet that takes yeah, an immense amount of, of, uh, of energy to hold that space and, and allow for people to make whatever new connections they need to make themselves without force feeding them that you have to do this, 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 that, and this. It just allow them to make whatever two or three new connections they need to make because we all need time to grow. Our brain synapses need time to evolve. And in the process, you just got to hold space. <laughs> I love it. Thank you so much for sharing, bro. I am um, going to ask you my uh, my last question, and it's by no means my least question. Um, totally. And it's 
existential in its nature and uh, yeah, it basically goes along the lines of beyond the skin suit, beyond the activism, beyond the stories, mm. beyond the name, beyond what we see. Who is Erfan? Erfan, beyond all of that, um, is a single cell within an infinite organism. That's all it is. Um, it's, yeah, the seemingly insignificant part of, of, a, of a much, much, much larger body that um, is trying, it, it's got some level of self-awareness um, and is actively engaged in the process of its connection to the rest of the body. <laughs> that's, that's all it is, really. <laughs> you know, um, that's, uh, that's all Erfan really is. That's all... Um, that's all I am. It, it's uh, there. There is no significance to um, this individual life. It, uh, it's greater than than the life of the of the collective. Um, and yeah, it's it's all temporary. It's um, it's it's a bit you know almost like a dream. Not quite, but um, Erfan is just a, a single cell in a very complex and infinite eternal organism. That's evolving. <laughs> I feel very blessed to be part of this organism with you that's evolving, brother. So Thanks, brother. It's a, it's thank a joy. You, thank you so much for, for today, My taking your time and your energy to be here and share your, yeah, your insights. Absolutely. It's been an absolute <laughs> joy. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, really good conversation. <laughs> I, um, I also really want to thank you um, for just, you know, all the work that it takes, you know, like, you know, you said there's been anger and there's been resolution. Obviously, there's you know a lot that's happening in your family to cultivate and grow. You know the person that we're mm. sitting in front of today as well. Um, so I just really want to take a moment to acknowledge and thank you know all the work that goes into us preceding this conversation, having the ability to have this conversation today as well. Thank you. And um, no I'm really yeah I'm really excited and I really wish you all the best for the future, but also the immediate future because new kind is only <laughs> two months away. So yes. <laughs> That we should really wish you all the best for that. So normally, the, I try and get people to find out how best to get in touch with you, and we can totally do that. But can we um, maybe have a quick chat about how best to you know find our tickets to New Kind, or you know, how do we get them totally? Back? Yeah, just you, we can get just straight to the website newkindfestival.com, yeah. um, and every, literally everything's there. Program guide. The, the ticketing system, uh, links to our socials. It's all on newkindfestival.com. Um, and what I want your listeners to also understand is if, if people want to use the promo code Inspired Evolution um, before the end of this uh, year, actually, no, right the way through, anytime, Inspired Evolution, they'll, they'll get 20% off uh, a ticket to Newkind. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> to your podcast. <laughs> uh, Thank you so much. Uh, yeah. That is no, my pleasure. That is, that is so generous. I know Orfan personally, and I know how much it takes to have a festival without waste, supplying all the food for all the days, and like international speakers flying in from all over the world to come do this. Totally. And uh, yeah, no, that is that is beyond generous. That's putting you out of pocket. But thank you so nah, much. My pleasure. <laughs> my, my pleasure. Absolutely. And uh, yeah, it's an absolute honor and a blessing to be able to support um, you kind. And uh, yeah, so tell me, for those that want to get in touch with you personally, what's the best way to do that? Um, my website is my name as well, airfunddeliry.com. So then that's got links to my socials on Facebook. You, my email is on my website as well. You can write to me directly if you want. Um, so yeah, they're per- both pretty easy. Newkindfestival.com and erifandeliri.com. Um, so if you can just drop those links in, then people can contact me directly as well about anything, whether it's um, to speak at, a, at an event or to help collaborate on a project for social justice, whatever it might be. Um, this is my life. This is what I do like day in, day out. I don't have a, a day job to see to or a family to see to. Like I'm constantly available uh, for this type of stuff. So yeah, hit me up anytime. And I think I just want to speak to that a little bit as well for those listening is that um, one of the biggest things is just how available you really are despite all the amazing things that you're working on. I think that's um, really incredible and not just the availability but also the, the humility um, Thank that you. you hold, you know, at any given time to just be able to be accessible, be available for anybody that comes your way. Um, yeah, just always holding space. So I, I 
yeah, really respect and value the space that you hold, brother. And uh, thank you so much again. For <laughs> Peace. Thank you so much for that blessing. <laughs> Love Love service. I appreciate it a lot. Thanks so much for having me. I've really enjoyed this. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we'll catch up soon. Thank you guys so much for tuning in to the Love of the Inspired Evolution and sharing the Love of the Inspired Evolution. If you feel like this content may support, has supported you or may support anyone else that you know may resonate with the content of it, please share away and share the love around. Thank you guys so much. And to stay up to date on whatever's coming out with the Inspired Evolution, please subscribe. There's all these links in the bio for you to tune into the episodes and all these different platforms just so the message can get to you and your loved ones. Thank you so much for all your love and support. Stay inspired to evolve.